Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Matt Piper. I'm the Global Director for Industry Solutions for Utilities and AEC at Esri. We are really excited to have you here today for this third and final webinar in the Utility Network webinar series. This series has been the most successful webinar series to date. We had a fantastic attendance for the first webinar, which was on the seven steps to getting started with the ArcGIS Utility Network. And in late July, we again broke our registration records for the second webinar, which covered off the business value of the ArcGIS Utility Network. And finally, today in this webinar, we are going to cover off how to migrate to and implement the ArcGIS Utility Network. One of the most common questions we get in these webinars is, can I get access to the slides and will this recording be made available? So I want to address this straight away. The answer is yes. Yes, we will make the presentation available in PDF. And yes, we will provide a link to the recording in about a week. And if for some reason you didn't make the previous two webinars, as you have registered for this webinar, you will get access to the whole series, which means the previous recordings and PDF documents are also available to you. Well, as I said, this has been the most successful webinar series, and we have over 2,700 people registered today. So thank you again for joining. And just like in the previous webinars, we want to ensure that any question you have gets answered. In the middle of your screen, there is a chat option. Please write any questions you have as we go along. And we will get to you with either response during the webinar or as a follow-up after the webinar in a quick Q&A document. And just a reminder again, this is being recorded and the recordings will be made available following the series. I've already introduced myself but I want to take this opportunity to welcome our other speakers. It is safe to say that I am well out of my depth today with the level of technical expertise we have online. Be sure to fire them in because we have the technical experts here. The first is Paul LeBlanc. He's a senior developer on the Esri Solutions team. Also, we have Tiffany Weintrapp, a technical consultant from the Esri Professional Services team. And returning again following his starring role in Webinar 1 is John Long, who is a senior consultant with Esri Professional Services and he brings a lot of industry experience after already actively being involved in projects with utilities to implement successful go lives. So welcome everybody, and let's get started. As usual in these webinars, we have packed as much as we can into this one hour webinar. So let's take a quick look at the agenda. I will start with a high level objectives of the agenda, then John will lead discussions on some of the foundational solutions, and then help us understand some of the migration options. Paul and Tiffany will then discuss alternate migration tools before John and I recap and wrap up the webinar. Well, before we get into any of the details, I'd just like to cover off our objectives and recap where we are at within this webinar series to give you some context. We discussed in webinar two, the business value of ArcGIS and how the capabilities tie back to KPIs. This webinar presented the value in a way that is transparent to executives and leaders on how GIS is critical to achieving the vision and goals of their utility. In webinar one, we discussed the detailed components of the utility network, which helps get you understanding the basics and understanding why we did it. But we also talked about how to get started with preparing your data, performing some gap analysis, and establishing some of the proof of concepts to get you going quickly and easily. In this webinar, we're going to extend your journey and detail some of the best practices on how to migrate to the ArcGIS Utility Network and how to deliver successful implementations. With this in mind, I would like to welcome back again, of course, my good friend, John Long, who's gonna take us through some of the tools to support your implementation. John, over to you. Excellent, thank you, Matt. Uh, it's good to be back. As Matt mentioned, I'm a senior consultant for Esri's Utility Professional Services. My colleagues and I are going to spend a little time with you today to brief you on the topics of utility network migration and implementation. But before we jump in, we would like to take a quick poll. Tiffany, what are our first polling questions today? Hi, John. Sure. What is your biggest concern with migrating to and implementing the ArcGIS utility network? Source data quality and consistency, data migration, integrations with other systems, change management, or time and resources? All right, we're getting lots of answers already, John. Excellent. You guys are coming in. Give you a few more seconds to get your answers in there. All right, what do you say we close the polls, Tiffany? 
Oh, yes, sounds good. Excellent, thank you. So by the results of it, we've got a pretty even distribution uh, between data migration, uh, integrations with other systems, uh, and uh, you know, source data quality and consistency. Uh, the nice thing is, is that uh, it seems the majority of the people here, um, you know, their biggest concern is data migration. Uh, the good news is, is you guys are definitely in the right webinar, uh, and we hope the uh, information that we provide will uh, support you in your efforts. All right, so let's uh, move on to uh, jump right in, shall we? All right, so when looking in, when looking to embark on any project, I always look for aids to give me a head start. For your utility network implementation, one of those aids is the Esri Enterprise Data Management Solutions, which we commonly refer to as the Utility Network Foundation Solutions. These foundation solutions provide you with a baseline schema for your commodity. Predefined utility network properties like tiers, asset groups, and asset types are configured in this schema. In addition, it provides pre-configured connectivity rules. This schema and the configurations are known as an asset package. The benefits of an asset package is that network modeling and configuration start at an advanced state rather than at ground level providing you with a significant reduction in time and configuration of your commodities information model. In addition, there are ArcGIS Pro projects that also accompany the asset package. These Pro projects are configured to work with the asset package model and include symbology. These Pro projects are great starting points for or templates for your Pro project configuration efforts for editing and publishing the utility network. If you attended the first webinar in this series, you heard Chris talk about setting up your own proof of concept with your utilities data. As a precursor to setting up your own POC, you might want to gain information or understanding on how the software functions and behaves with the data model, or understand how the data is applied to the data model. Having a sample data set allows you to build your knowledge and understanding at a minimal expense. Before proceeding with any data translation efforts. So, you may be wondering how do I get access to these great resources? To obtain your commodities foundation solutions, you'll need to download and install the ArcGIS solution deployment add in and the utility network package tools for your ArcGIS Pro client. Now that you have your asset package, you may want to gain a better understanding of the details of that model. A data dictionary is provided for each asset package configuration. This allows you to explore the properties of the data model. This understanding will help you when it comes time to map out your source to target data migration. So let's take a quick look at how the data dictionary is, pre is presented to you. The menu provides basic functions to manage what is presented to you. The table of contents allows you to navigate to specific items in the data model that you want more information about. The object card contains the properties of the items that you have selected. And finally, the object properties provide you with the details of the items you have selected. So I often get asked the question, where is the physiological model diagram that accompanies these asset packages or data models? Personally, I think providing a, a model in this format would be a little bit confusing uh, because the, the underlying utility network model has been denormalized and the connectivity is done at a subclassification level. As a result, the variables are too many to be displayed on the diagram of this nature. So next, I'd like to walk you through some of the tools that will help you to prepare for your data migration. The asset package that you downloaded comes with sample data, data, as I mentioned, and as a result, has a spatial reference. To make the asset package usable for your data, you'll need to empty the contents of the asset package and change the spatial reference. The good news is there is a geoprocessing script installed with the UN tools that help you easily perform this task. Another useful tool that you'll find installed with the UN tools is the rename table. This table allows you to rename items in your asset package while maintaining the integrity of the asset package. This is handy if you want to rename items such as the asset groups or asset types 
to match your utilities nomenclature, or if you want to localize the items configured in the asset package, such as tiers or field aliases, to your local language. It's a really helpful tool to, to make that data model your own. Another question that comes up quite frequently is how can I remove configured items in the asset package that don't apply to my utility? A great example is a distribution electric utility that doesn't want transmission configurations in their utility network as they technically don't apply to them. Well, I'm pleased to let you know that there's a way to do this through the configuration table. The configuration table is also part of the UN tools and is created with the geoprocessing script that lays down a table that will be used to define what asset package items will be excluded when you apply your asset package to the utility network. In my experiences, these are three very powerful tools that help streamline basic modeling needs to modify the asset package to provide value to your implementation. Now let's jump right into the migration tools. Because the title of this webinar leads in with migration, I'm assuming many of you are here to hear about migration to the utility network. And based on the first poll, uh, I think that's a pretty safe assumption. So let's get started. To set the framework, or set the foundation, Ezra provides three primary options to, for migrating your data to the utility network. Append, the data loading tools, and the ArcGIS data interoperability extension. The tool you choose is greatly dependent on what you are trying to achieve with your output and what you're working with with source data. The matrix illustrates capabilities increase as your tool set progresses. One thing to keep in mind is that there is also a correlation between the complexity of the configuration as the capabilities increase. Soon we're, soon we're gonna dive into each of these in more depth. However, at a high level, the most basic of the migration tools is append, whereas the data loading tools, the data interoperability extension provide more extensible framework to manage your migration. And based on what we know of our utility customers, we have chosen to focus on two tools today, the data loading tools and the ArcGIS data interoperability extension, as these tools are better suited to meet your migration needs. You should also note that many of our partners with the utility network specialty have migration tools and or capabilities to support you with your utility network implementation needs. But no matter what the tool you choose, the process of migrating the data is generally the same. First, you need a model, the, you need to model the target schema. While the asset package provides you with a head start, there will still be adjustments that you will want to make to address the business requirements and make the data model your own. Once you have a target model in place, the work begins to map your source data to the target model. Having a good understanding of your source data and the target model will greatly help you, as this is a fairly tedious task. Here, you will map existing features to their target features and the corresponding asset groups and asset types, the source fields to the target fields, and the source coded value domains and descriptions to their target counterparts. These mappings are key to your migration process. So Tiffany, what do you think about another poll? Sounds good. Which data migration tools below are you familiar with or have you used? Append geoprocessing tool, data loading tools, data interoperability tools, Esri partner solutions, or none of the above? Responses are pouring in, Tiff. Yes, they are. I'm excited to see. All right, what do you think? We should close the polls? Let's go ahead and do it. All right. Well, it's a pretty close, uh, you know, distribution here um, with uh, really the majority of the folks uh, having a, an understanding of the data uh, loading tools. Um, I'm sure Paul's happy to hear and see those results. Um, you know, for those of you not familiar with these tools, uh, I think you're going to find them a very uh, capable way to migrate your data to the utility network. Uh, for those familiar, you're definitely going to be interested with the road ahead uh, on these tools. Uh, for those that are uh, none of the above, uh, I think, uh, you know, what Paul and Tiffany are going to bring to the table 
uh, is really uh, going to kind of help uh, educate you guys. Uh, but uh, I think uh, overall, we've got our work cut out with us, uh, along with the, all those business partners that are listening today uh, to educate our, our audience on what tools are available to them. All right, so what do you say we hop in and start talking about migration tools? We're not going to spend a lot of time on Append. However, you should be aware that it is a migration tool that is available to you. Append really only facilitates simple data loading with some general filtering logic. Basically, it supports direct loading of data from field mappings. Keep in mind, it does not support translation of values. Since I anticipate most of you have coded value domains as part of your source data model and are looking for more advanced transformations, you're going to be interested in the information my colleague Paul and Tiffany provide. So without any additional hesitation, I would like to pass it over to Paul to share with you the capabilities of the data loading tools. Thanks, John. Let's now take a look at another option to migrate our data. The data loading tools extend the core append geoprocessing tool by allowing in-flight data transformation, which is powered by calculate fields and Python expressions. You can perform ad hoc ETL, or for more complex transformations, create mapping workbooks that allow you to specify your transformation in a series of Excel workbooks. These mapping workbooks are really key for the migration process because they provide a self-documenting workflow that is easily repeatable. This is important because data migration is usually an iterative process. We might load a subset of our data into the utility network, enable the network topology, and analyze any errors that might have been introduced. If needed, we can tweak the mapping workbooks and reload the data, all in a few clicks. Here's a few examples of how the data loading tools can be used. I'm a local county parcel manager. I have a defined schema that my parcels use, but it's a little bit different than the statewide database. On a regular basis, I provide a data dump to be aggregated in a statewide parcel layer. I define my mapping workbooks once and can use the new geoprocessing scheduler provided in ArcGIS Pro to transform my data. Every month, the data loading tools will automatically run and transform my parcel schema into a staging geodatabase. Another example in the middle here is that I have a condensed schema that is being widened in my new CRM system. We see that address is stored as a single attribute, but in the new system, I require three separate attributes to store street, city, and zip code. I can use a simple string operation to split the single line address, or we can write an even better function in Python using powerful regular expressions to handle more edge cases. And finally, the reason why we are all here today is migrating data into the utility network. As long as the source data can be used in the append tool, then the data loading tools can be used to load and transform it. This means geometric network feature classes, shape files, CAD data, and feature services can all be used as input. One important thing to keep in mind is that the data loading tools are designed for attribute transformation. If geometry manipulation is needed, it will need to be performed as either a pre- or post-processing workflow. Later, Tiffany will show the data interoperability workspaces, which can be used to perform geometry transformation in flight, and if needed, generate new features for assemblies. So in order to use the data loading tools, let's see what we, are, let's see what we need. First, you'll need Microsoft Excel. This is required to modify the mapping workbooks. You will map source to target fields and create lookup functions by defining what the source value is and what it will become in the target. Because the data loading tools are provided as a geoprocessing toolbox, you'll need ArcGIS Pro 2.4 or later. In order to work with asset packages and the utility network, having UN tools installed is also required. Next, we need a target schema to load our data into. This can be one of the foundational data models that John talked about earlier. We have water, sewer, storm water, electric, gas, and later this year, we will release a telecommunications model. These data models have a core schema that you can extend to fit your business requirements. Or it can be a baseline schema that you've modeled yourself following the schema requirements of the utility network. 
And because we will want to verify the results of our data loading, there are some licensing requirements to work with the utility network. As I mentioned before, enabling the network topology to discover utility network errors can help uncover incorrect mappings. Using the trace geoprocessing tool is also helpful to determine connectivity and traversability of your network features. If you are using ArcGIS Pro 2.5, you can use a file geodatabase utility network, which provides a quick way to get started prototyping. So at a high level, here's the process. First, you clone your Python environment so you can install the data loading tools. Next, familiarize yourself with the source data and target. Knowing what feature classes and subtypes will be used in the target is needed to create the workspace. This is a collection of mapping workbooks. Here, you map source fields to target and translate coded value domains. Using the Python Package Manager and ArcGIS Pro, you can create new Python environments, which are isolated from each other. Cloning allows you to install Python packages such as UN tools and DLT solutions, the utility network tools, and the data loading tools. Once we've installed these tools, a new toolbox will appear in the system toolboxes of ArcGIS Pro. So now that the tools have been installed, you can start mapping your source and target data sets. This requires familiarity with the target UN schema, so using the data dictionaries that John showcased earlier would really be helpful here. Here we see an example water geometric network as the source on the left and the target utility network or asset package geodatabase on the right. I've already mapped a handful of the feature classes, W main to water line and W pump, W service connection and W system valve to water device. Now that the classes have been mapped together, I specify an output folder where the data loading workspace will be generated. This will create a collection of Excel workbooks where the field mapping and translation occurs. Compare this to the append tool, which is loading data from source to target. Append uses a field map as a parameter, and the data loading tools use Excel workbooks to define how target fields will be populated. For each pair of source and target data sets, an Excel workbook is created. On the left are all the point feature classes that I defined in the geoprocessing tool. Let's take a look at the W-Fitting Water Junction Workbook. The tool creates multiple worksheets in each workbook, which you can see along the bottom. The three sheets in yellow are provided as reference. They can be used while filling out the main mapping sheet, which is currently active. The blue sheets at the end are user-defined, which we'll get to a bit later. In the main mapping sheet, all of the target fields, which are in column A, have been, filled, have been filled out for you automatically. There are multiple ways a target field can be populated. Let's first look at expression, which is in column C. There are three ways this can be defined, a field match, a constant value, or a Python expression. Some fields in my source data do not require any translation and can be loaded directly. Here. Last update exists in both source and target, so that is an easy match. Other straight field mappings, such as facility ID to asset ID, and location description to notes, require an understanding of the target schema. These cells have dropdowns, so choosing a source field only takes a few clicks. Looking at asset group, I do not have any field in my source that matches this. However, Asset group is one of the key attributes in the utility network, and this field should always be populated. I know that subtype 20 in the water junction utility network target class is a fitting, so all the features being loaded from W fitting will be assigned to this subtype. Finally, the global ID field in my target is being populated with a Python function, create GUID. The data loading tools ship with some predefined Python functions that are ready to use. They are defined in a scripts folder, and you can extend them or add your own. The second way a target field can be populated is by lookup. This uses one or more source fields with a lookup table to translate the values. My source data has a field called fitting type that is being mapped to the asset type field. Unlike last update and facility ID, I cannot map this field directly because fitting type is a string in my source data, and asset type in my target is an integer. Opening the fitting type worksheet, the p fitting type coded value domain has been pre-populated for me. 
In the target columns, I've manually specified what integer values match to these source string values. So taking a step back, there's my source geometric network on the left and target utility network on the right. As before, water fittings is being loaded into the water junction feature class asset group fitting. My source fitting type and target asset type fields have coded value domains. I use a lookup to transform these values, bend to elbow, cap to end cap, coupling to coupling, and so forth. There are some values in my source, such as over under, that do not exist in my target. That's okay. I can either add a new asset type in the utility network for over under, or if my source data does not have any features of this type, I can skip them. Similarly, my target has asset types that do not have a match in my water fitting source data. There might be other source feature classes for saddle or screw that can be loaded. If not, then these can be skipped as well. So I've gone through and repeated this process for all of the other input data, my, my points, lines, polygons, and any tabular data I have. Once completed, I use the execute data load geoprocessing tool to load all of my defined workbooks. If needed, I can go back and tweak some of the workbooks, truncate my data, and reload the process again, enabling network topology to discover errors and so forth. So here's some of the enhancements that we have planned for the next few releases of the data loading tools. Earlier, I showed creating the Excel workbooks by specifying source and target feature classes. Instead, you can input a pair of geodatabases and the tool will find source and target tables and subtypes to automatically map. Creating the field mappings and lookup tables can be a time intensive process. So based on the similarities between source and target fields and coded value domains, these worksheets will be filled out. You can still manually tweak them, but this fuzzy matching should reduce manual definition significantly. This matching and the workspace mapping below can be augmented with known mappings such as the local government information model and other commonly adopted data models. Because data migration is iterative, you will sometimes need to change your target schema while defining the workbooks. Each time you run the tools, a new workspace is created. An option will be exposed to run against an existing workspace and synchronize changes. Finally, we want to expose granular feature counts. When we were mapping water fittings, over under was not a valid target value. Using the statistics, I can quickly determine if there are any over under values in my source. This report can help you prioritize what mapping should happen first. So that was a quick overview of the data loading tools. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Tiffany, who will walk you through the data interoperability tools. Hello everyone. We heard from John and Paul on the append and data loading tools. Now let's look at the data interoperability tools for migrating data into the utility network. Data interoperability tools are framework configurations to support advanced data transformation using the geospatial extract, transform, and load tool. This is commonly referred to as an ETL tool and may be opened, configured, and ran from either the ArcGIS Data Interoperability Extension or Safe Software's FME. Like Paul mentioned earlier with the data loading tools, your data mapping will be captured in an Excel document that will be used as input to the migration tool. We will be building on this though for additional in-flight transformation during the migration process. Ideally, the person performing this conversion is familiar with ETL tools and how to manipulate them for various source to target mapping, but it's also a great opportunity to dive in and learn. The data interoperability tools give the user much more flexibility in how the source data gets moved to the target schema, as well as provides additional capabilities during the process. We can read and write to multiple data types. This could be something like source data from a feature class, an Excel spreadsheet, and a table that will get pushed into a single output feature class. We can also build advanced in-flight transformations. Some examples would be performing a proximity between features of certain types and then offsetting one by a set distance if certain testing criteria are met, or creating a new polygon feature from existing point source data and pushing both out to their respective writers with appropriate attribution. Finally, 
we can migrate utility assets into a utility network management system. Okay, now that we've gone over what the data interoperability tools are, here's what you will need to get started. You'll need Microsoft Excel for working with the data mapping workbook, ArcGIS Pro 2.4 or later with the UN tools installed so that you're able to configure and work with your utility network, the ArcGIS data interoperability extension for configuring and executing the migration tools, now there are several solutions available for each utility domain, but the Utility Network Foundation solution for your commodity contains the baseline asset package. This can be used as a starting point for your target schema. You'll need a staged file or enterprise geodatabase. This can be used to further validate your migration results by enabling topology and checking for network errors. And last but not least, as always, there are some licensing requirements for working with the utility network. So please make sure you have the appropriate user types or server extensions, depending on your version. So there are six high level steps to perform a migration to the utility network using the data interoperability tools. The first step is to analyze source data and target schema. This could be treated like an in-house data readiness assessment, provided the additional QAQC steps were performed to measure the source data health with respect to moving into the utility network. At this stage, you can use the data dictionary John showed earlier to get familiar with the available target baseline asset package. I will say this will serve as a great reference throughout the process. Second step is to download the template workbench for your commodity. These can be found on Safe Software's site. We'll provide a link to the download files in the resources slide. The third step is to map your sources to targets in the schema mapper. The schema mapper is the Excel data mapping workbook I mentioned earlier, and we'll be discussing this in more detail later. For this step, I would suggest performing a data mapping workshop with GIS analysts and key stakeholders in your organization. This is usually a time-consuming step, but necessary to ensure the utility network will work for everyone moving forward. This is also a great time to clean up legacy items that may not be used anymore. Step four, prepare the target asset package. Here, you will make required modifications to the asset package based on the results of the data mapping workshop. There are several ways to make schema changes to a data model. But keep in mind that the asset package has lots of configurations and dependent values for the network. I suggest using the utility network specific geoprocessing tools and configuration tables when possible. Step five, update the data interoperability tool. Here you'll apply the necessary changes such as updating the readers, writers, and transformers. Optionally, if you decide to have assemblies as part of your migration, you may edit the Assembly Builder XML file to include additional assembly templates to the baseline configuration. This all depends on your source data and what you're expecting to get out in the asset package. In step six, execute the ETL. Now I will note that steps three through six will likely be an iterative process. You will find that you may want to modify original mapping definitions or transformer settings in order to create the cleanest asset package possible to apply to your utility network. There are nine standard tabs or sheets in the schema mapper file. Each one has a purpose and is used in different translators throughout the workspace. If you look at the list on the left, these are the key tabs you will find when opening the schema mapper for any commodity. There's a caveat to this. If you are using the electric migration workbench, there will be some additional tabs that will require data mapping updates as well. In blue, we have the Asset Group and Type tab. This contains the source to target mapping for asset groups and asset types. This is used by the workbench to assign an asset group and asset type value to each feature so that they get written to the appropriate place in the utility network. In purple, we have the Domains tab. This contains the value mapping from the source data to the utility network for all mapped attribute fields. The utility network domains are mostly integer coded values, so this will be very important to translate those text or string coded values from your source data. And finally, 
In orange, we have the Domain and Structure Network Feature Class tabs. There is a tab for each commodity, device, line, junction, and assembly feature class, as well as a tab for each structure network feature class. Each of these contain the source to target attribute field mapping. I know there's a lot of information to fill out up front, but it's important to spend the time to get the schema mapper filled out completely and correctly. Let's look at a few examples and I'll provide some tips for completing the data mapping file. We'll start with the asset group and type mapping example. All available asset group and asset type features should be listed here to include any asset groups or asset types that were added as a result of the data mapping workshop. As I mentioned earlier, the ArcGIS feature class column is where you start to configure the source mapping definition for each target feature. The schema mapper has columns built in so that up to four attributes may be used as available mapping filters, but this is configurable. Let's talk about the different scenarios you may come across while completing the mapping. If you need to map features from multiple sources to a single target, copy the entire row and paste it in as needed. Like I mentioned earlier, each mapping should get its own row. If a single source needs to be pushed out to multiple targets, you will need at least one attribute to filter on. Usually, this is a subtype field, but it can be any relevant attribute. Copy the entire row and paste it in as needed, and then populate the attribute definition fields. Notice the poll feature class mapped in the example is set to push features into four different target asset types, but we have seven rows. The primary attribute name is populated with poll use, and the primary attribute value has all the individual field values listed appropriately. If you are mapping a single source to a single target, then you only need to map the feature class name. If you want to filter by null values in an attribute field, populate the attribute field name, but leave the attribute value blank. Let's move on to the domain mapping example. There are two ways to configure domain mapping in the schema mapper. The first way is to configure a universal domain mapping that will be applied whenever the specified ArcGIS field to utility network field translation is found during the migration. Notice the ArcGIS feature class field does not have a source feature class name. The second way is a feature class specific domain mapping. You may have a diameter field and several source feature classes that are all being migrated to the same target device feature class, but each of those sources have a different domain assigned for the diameter fields. You can provide a domain mapping for each one. Notice we do have a feature class name populated in the ArcGIS feature class column. Any fields that participate in the domain value mapping do not have to be set in the attribute field map tabs for those values to carry over. They will be read from here. Let's take a look at the attribute mapping example. The UN attribute name column is a list of all available attributes for this network feature class. If there are any additional fields that are expected to carry over from the source, they should be added to the bottom of this list. The ArcGIS feature attribute column is where the name of the source field containing the appropriate values to bring over is populated. Since you may have more than one source being mapped to the target, you may need to bring over values from multiple source fields. If that is the case, simply copy the entire row and paste it in as needed, like you did in the other tabs for the schema mapper. If there is no source data for that field, leave it blank. Notice the asset ID field has two sources mapped to it, facility ID and TP number. Also, take a look at the owned by and maintained by fields. They may look a little different to you. Because we use those in our domain value mapping, we could leave the column blank. I suggest putting in a note in brackets or parentheses so the workspace does not pick up the mapping, but you maintain a complete record of what source field attributes were mapped to that target feature class. Now for some general notes. All feature class names and field values are case sensitive and should be copied exactly as they are in the source data. However, all field names should be uppercase as they are all set to uppercase in the beginning of the workspace. Do not map global IDs in the attribute mapping tabs. These are set in the workspace and will cause issues if they are also mapped here. 
Once the data mapping is complete, there is one more possible configuration file we need to look at prior to updating the migration workspace. We have referred to assemblies and the assembly builder throughout this webinar as optional features for your utility network. But if these are something you're looking to include, there may be some upfront work required. When we talk about the assembly builder, we're referring to a combination of an XML file used as a template for defining assembly configurations, as well as the additional workspace in the migration tool that creates this data. The assemblies are created along with their contained features, terminals, and associations. The assembly builder addresses the composition and location of the individual devices contained within an assembly feature, derives contained devices from source unit data, creates new devices and junctions from logic defined within the XML file, and finally sets terminal configurations, associations, and phase expansion based on tags assigned in the workspace. If these are something you wish to include, this file has a baseline of configurations, but you may need to include more depending on what you're looking to have in your output asset package. All right, now that we have the target schema modified, our source data mapped, and potentially our assembly builder XML updated, it is time to familiarize ourselves with the migration workbench. There are a few key areas to know for configuration and troubleshooting throughout the migration process. We will go left to right. In orange, there's the navigator pane. This is a list of all the readers, writers, input parameters, transformers, and bookmarks. This can be used to navigate the workspace. If you expand a group, you can see the nested items and click on it to have the workspace pan to and zoom in on its location. In Peach, there are the workspace tabs. Some commodity migration workbenches, such as Electric, have multiple workspaces. One tab is the main workspace and one tab is the assembly builder workspace. This is like having two parts to one ETL tool. It is important to note which workspace you are in when making edits. In light blue, there are the feature types for the source data readers. This is essentially all of the source feature classes. In purple, there's the schema mapping translation section of the workspace. This is where a majority of the schema mapper translators are located and where you would troubleshoot if there are missing asset group asset types or errors with asset group asset type mappings. In green, we have the assembly builder section of the workspace. If you are migrating to a higher fidelity utility network that has assembly features being created, you will need to pay special attention here. This is where the complex device features are given a tag attribute and passed into the assembly builder workspace. That tag attribute will determine the template used from the XML to create the assembly in all containing features. Here is where the features pass into the assembly builder workspace and then when they are done processing, get pushed back over to the main workspace. In red is the error writer section. This is where all features given an error flag in either the main or assembly builder workspace are written out to both an error summary Excel spreadsheet and an error file geodatabase. Finally, in dark blue are the feature types for the target data writers. And essentially, this is all of your output feature classes. Okay, we are finally ready to configure our workspace. First, you're going to add in a new reader for your source data and import the appropriate feature types. You only need to select the features that are participating in the migration. You will configure the new sources in the workspace. To do this, connect them to the appropriate transformer and remove the existing sample data feature type. You'll want to make sure to turn on the FME feature type format attribute for each added feature type. A little hint, you may use the bulk apply to option in the bottom of this menu. Next, you need to update the attribute manager parameters. There will be an attribute manager transformer for each source feature and these are configured based on the type of feature. For example, we have devices, unit tables, structure junctions, and more. Each of these may have their own custom settings and so you just want to review these before um, making your changes. I also suggest reading the notes in this section about what attributes are required and which ones can be removed to keep the clutter down as you advance across the workspace. 
Next, you're going to update the input parameters and the transformers. You can use the Navigator pane to update the remaining input parameters. They will be listed in the Publish Parameters of the User Parameters group. You do not need to create a new copy of the template asset package to write into for each run. Just put your desired output name in the target asset package parameter. The workbench will create it from the predefined template asset package. Same goes for the error file geodatabase and the error spreadsheet. The workbench will create them if they do not already exist. As a reminder, this window will pop up every time you run the workspace, so you'll be able to update the output names for each run. Next, in the Navigator pane, you're going to expand the incomplete transformers group and make sure to update each of those. You may also have to go in and update tester or filter transformers in various sections of the workspace. It's best to walk through each section when you initially set this up. As a final note on running the workspace, I would suggest turning off feature caching before doing the full migration run, especially if you're working with a lot of features. It's good to have it on during smaller testing iterations when you're initially configuring and when you're looking at section by section, but for the full run, I suggest turning it off to eliminate any possible errors. Sometimes these workbenches can run for hours and it is a little frustrating to get to the end and then you have an error because feature caching was left on. All right, I'm gonna hand this back over to John so he can go over final steps. Excellent. Thank you, Tiffany. Since Paul and Tiffany have provided me with migrated data in an asset package format, I'm now ready to finalize the implementation. First things first, I have to stage my utility network. What staging does is create the required data set and utility network in a geodatabase. This can be an enterprise geodatabase, or since the ArcGIS Pro 2.5 release, it can be a file geodatabase. One thing of note, there is another geoprocessing tool called Create Utility Network. While at face value, the, this tool may seem to address your needs, it must be combined with other geoprocessing tools to truly stage your utility network. Once I've configured and run the stage utility network geoprocessing script, the results, the result is required data, the result is the required data set and utility network in a geo database with my service territory loaded. Next, I'm going to run the apply asset package geoprocessing tool. This tool validates the integrity of the asset package, then applies the asset package to the staged utility network. Now it's time to enable the topology. At this phase of the process, we want to run this with the only generate errors option. This allows us to get a sampling of the network errors that we are encountering. For your maximum number for, of errors, I would start with a lower number like 8,000 or 10,000 and increase it as you iterate through the process, which leads us to our first decision point. If you have an abundance of errors, there may be things that you can do in the mapping or migration process, or even configuration of the model and or rules to alleviate those, those errors. After analysis, I've determined that I need to go back to the drawing board and work with Paul and Tiffany to make updates to our data mapping and migration, as well as alter some connectivity rules in our network. After we've remedied the errors, and iterated through the previous steps, we are now ready to proceed to the next step. If my target utility network is an enterprise geodatabase, I will now need to register my dataset as branch version. Now's the point where I'm ready to enable topology on my entire dataset. Keep in mind that you are more than likely still going to have errors. Don't feel alone. None of your utility colleagues have been bragging about how perfect their data is either. However, I would recommend putting a plan in place to address the errors long-term so that your digital model accurately reflects what is in the real world. The next step is also only applicable if you're using an enterprise geodatabase. 
you'll need to publish your utility network services. Now we're close to the finish line. If your asset package has defined sub, has already defined subnetwork controllers, you'll now need to run update subnetwork. Next, you'll want to, to run your update is connected. And the end result is your very own utility network for managing your utilities assets across the enterprise. We've covered a lot today and we're running a little short on time. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Matt to close us out and provide you with some additional resources and useful links that might be valuable to you as you embark on your own utility network implementation. Matt, back to you. Hi, John, and thanks, Tiffany and Paul, for, uh, for going through those in detail. Well, John's right, we have covered a lot of content today um, but I have seen an awful lot of questions come streaming in. So thank you everyone for your active participation. As far as other resources on the screen, you can see, you know, we really wanna make this as easy as possible for you to get all your questions resolved. And while we will get that Q&A document, there is a lot of useful resources that you have access to um, and you can take advantage of. So these include things like technical papers, there's learning plans, there's also access to data migration and, and loading tools. Um, that we have available. So this, these links will be made available in the, in the documentation that we send to you. So please explore these um, and, and use these at your leisure. Well, that concludes the, the webinar uh, of the three-part series. But before we move on, I, I think it's worth noting that we actually have a number of partners that have completed our utility network specialty uh, designation. So we have 20 partners now uh, that have been through this program. And these partners, are actually extensions of our platform. So they either um, extend it through capabilities such as services, products, um, or even hardware. And please reach out to these partners, explore their websites, um, and see what other offerings they have in this space, because many of these have already successfully implemented either pilot um, or proof of concepts, the data migration, uh, the scoping, and a couple of these have actually managed to move um, customers successfully into production. So there's a full list on the web page here, um, but reach out and explore what our partners have to offer in this space as well. That's the three parts of the Utility Network series completed. Um, I really hope that you found this webinar series of value. It's been an absolute pleasure bringing this Utility Network series to you, and it's exciting for us to see the amount of energy in the market as customers are looking to move to this latest technology. Um, we really truly believe that it's transformational, and this technology will move you forward and, and service your utility for the next 20 years. So it's something we're, we're very excited to. It's something that we're looking forward to working with our customers to bring you success as you embark on this journey. We have a number of contacts um, available on the screen. So if you do have any questions and you wanna reach out, uh, all the technical ones, please send them to, to John, Tiffany and Paul. Um, they're the experts in this space. Uh, we also have some social handles um, that, that are available. So we have our Twitter accounts there, one for each industry. And I hope you all are familiar that we have our GeoNet community as well. So this is where you can reach out to Esri expertise, but also engage with other um, GIS professionals in the community. Um, many people are asking the same questions. A lot of questions you have, um, many people have already asked. So please jump online, explore what's available there. There's a number of blogs, papers, and of course, uh, an area where you can chat and collaborate with your fellow GIS professionals. We have, as John said, we've, we've run late on time. It's, it's usually the way we go. We, we, we're fairly packing content into these webinars to give you as much content as possible. Uh, but I wanna take this opportunity to, to thank uh, you know, the presenters, but also thank all of you for taking the time to both register and attend these webinars. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And with that, I'd like to close out this webinar series. So thank you very much, everybody.